Hey, Tommy, we've got the dream team back together again. Yeah, I, I'm not so sure that people are going to agree with that in the comments below, but it is another TFL Talking Cars podcast. Yeah, uh, we've been traveling. Uh, so I was in Korea and then in Alaska, and you were in a secret location in uh Arizona that we can't talk about yet. Yes, I hate when we mention things on the podcast we talk, can't talk about. This, this was like the tightest embargo. There were only three. Well, I can't talk about it, but it was very tight. There was an embargo on the, the embargo. embargo. Yeah, that's the first time we've ever seen an embargo <laughs> on the embargo. So we can't even talk about when the embargo lifts. Uh, and where else have you been? Um, I was, well, last week, Case and I talked about my trip to Germany. Yep. Where I was driving some uh, electric Mercedes products. And I'm trying to think what else I got going on. I got a trip next week to go drive the new Hyundai Palisade. And then we're going to go drive the GR Corolla pretty soon. Yeah, and I'm going next week to drive the new Type R. And I just got invited back to go compete in the Land Rover Trek. Congratulations. Which is pretty cool. So that is an off-road competition that my little team won last year in the Media Wave. And we're going to do it again, hopefully, in a new Defender. Yeah, you and Jeff Glucker and uh, Byron Dorr, right? Uh, Brian. Brian Dorr. Sorry, Brian Dorr. You guys were... Yeah. Uh, the, the team that uh, kicked uh, Lindsey Vaughn's butt, and you're going to go do it again. I wonder what celebrity they'll have this year. So that's going to be in Vermont this year, and it's a long trip, actually. I leave on a Friday and get back first thing on a Tuesday. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of negative comments because we've done a lot of EV coverage. Obviously, we just drove uh, the Lightning to the furthest northernmost point you can drive in the United States, which is uh, Dead Horse. Uh, and that's over at... Uh, well, all TFL, but the video that's coming, the exciting one, is this um, just posted this Sunday uh, on Truck, but we also did a podcast going over the behind the scenes, and David was my guest. So if you like David, check out the Truck Podcast where we spill the beans on how we got the uh, truck up there. But in this podcast, we're going to be talking about a couple interesting things. Uh, what are we talking about, Tommy? Well, we're going to be talking about the new Grand Cherokee 4xE V Acura MDX Type S. That's what we've been driving recently. The new Pathfinder Rock Creek, actually. The Mazda CX-50. And most interestingly, we've got a list here of the, the cars that are on dealership lots in the shortest supply. This is an iccars.com list. Ba basically, the fastest selling cars. Yeah, so they looked at over 224,000 transactions during... Uh, June to find out what the fastest selling cars are. Welcome to TFL Talk, the official podcast of TFL Studios, where we talk about the best and, yes, even sometimes the worst new cars. We talk about the coolest and sometimes the least uncool old cars. And, of course, we give you an insider's view of all things automotive. And hopefully we do it having fun and sometimes arguing. So if you're driving, keep driving. And if you're not, why not? Yeah, I think the market is slowly starting to come back to something of normalcy. I think when you start getting lists about cars that are actually sitting on dealer lots, that means that there's actually supply coming back into the mainstream of the automotive uh, dealership network, uh, which is a good thing because it's been just so crazy and goofy and out of whack the last, uh, what, two years now. You know, I can't wait to get back to those uh, uh, silly commercials where, you know, it's Toyota-thon. Uh, and come on down to the dealership, get yourself a hot dog, and buy yourself a Toyota. I think we're still a little ways out from that. But it does look like things are calling, calming down a little bit. Um, I want those guys with the, the arms the that go up. Yeah. Inflaty guys. <laughs> Inflaty guys, you know, trying to promote whatever. Yeah, the money on the hood eras. Um, yeah, Labor Day sale they got going on. I mean, it's funny. I hated all that stuff. And then when the supply dried up and it was dealers basically uh, doing shenanigans, uh, I thought to myself, you know, this uh, trying to sell cars is not such a bad thing versus begging for cars. So should we start with that list right away? Um, yeah, let's start with that list. Why not? Let's just go right to it. Uh, it's going from 20 to number one. Number one is actually very surprising. I'll give you a hint, guys. Uh, we actually have two of them in the office. Two people have them in the office. So number 20 on the list is the Toyota Highlander with an average of 26.4 days on the lot and a transaction price of 46332 Yeah, the Highlander is a perennial bestseller. It kind of hits a sweet spot uh, in terms of, you know, the fact that it's a three-row, uh, the fact that it is a hybrid so you can get good fuel economy. If you want a car that is reliable and can carry seven people and can do it forever, that's a good choice. Yep, and then number 19 on the list with a very high average transaction price, 62,731 and 25.9 days on the lot is the Jeep Wrangler Unlimited Hybrid, so specifically the 4xe. 
Yeah, so uh, we're going to be talking about the Grand Cherokee uh, 4 by e at the end of this because we have it sitting here just behind the doors to our studio. Uh, we've been driving it around for a while, but I get that. that That is the sweet spot in the Jeep Wrangler lineup because 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 it's a hybrid, uh, you get that $7,500 tax credit. Uh, so it's the cheapest Rubicon, or it was the cheapest Rubicon Jeep you could buy. So you can find them. Um, they're a good buy. That changed really quickly. Did it? Yeah. They quickly raise the price on it. Yeah, they made they figured that out, huh? Yeah, so I don't think it's any more the cheapest way to get a Rubicon. It's a good vehicle, though. So it's a plug-in hybrid. You can go like 20-something miles on a single charge. Squeaky chair has returned. I thought I, we just threw it away. I know. Let me uh, sw- You keep talking. I'm going to swap <laughs> chairs. All right. I'm gonna, I don't want to squeak through this. So 25 point, um, nine days on the lot. Uh, yeah, the plug-in hybrid, you can go 20-some miles on a single charge and then run on a little two-liter turbo gasoline engine when the battery dies. It's, it's a lot of technology in an off-roader, which I'm not incredibly stoked about. I think I like my off-roaders a little bit more simple. But if you have a short commute, and a lot of people do have a short commute, let's be honest, 5, 10, even 15 miles, you can do all of, if not um, the vast majority of your daily driving using electricity, charging up at home, and saving a lot of money that way. Uh, so let's actually, why don't we use this as a transition over to the uh, Grand Cherokee 4x that we have here. Um, and I'm kind of of two minds on that Jeep. Um, it's expensive, Tommy. It's like $70,000. The one we have equipped is an Overland uh, 4xE, of course, $75,000. Yeah, uh, and uh, to me, the biggest issue with it is, uh, you know, Grand Cherokees have always kind of been the car you lease for three years, and you throw your family in it, you throw your dog in it, uh, and then you kind of use and abuse it, and you return it to the dealership and move on to the next one, right? It's It's the... It's the Suburban of Jeep uh, that's a little bit smaller. And they seem to have gone after the Range Rover slash Land Rover market with this one in terms of kind of it's, it's got sc- multiple screens. Of course, it has air suspension, uh, massaging seats, I believe, Tommy. It's, it's got just, a passenger screen. Yeah, it's got a passenger screen. It just seems like it's, it's you know, a little over the top uh, for what the Grand Cherokee has always been, which is kind of, you know, your go-to middle-class uh, family off-roading uh, truckster. And the thing about the 4xE is even if you want the most affordable 4xE, you're still going to be paying $61,000. Well, I, I was doing some research, and I think the Grand Cherokee itself starts at 54000 No. Yeah. Much cheaper. No, 54 No, no, no. It's like 30s. Wait, wait, is it is it the 4 by 8 starts at 54? Maybe the 4 by E starts at 54. I don't know. No, I'm looking at it right now. The 4 by E Grand Cherokee yeah. starts at 60,695. Okay. And just the Grand Cherokee and itself. And the standard Grand Cherokee, not uh-huh. looking at the L, yeah, starts at 393. Okay. So 40 up to 7 up to 80. That's right. a big that's a big swath of uh, value there that that uh, you're adding when you get to the top. You you can go higher than than 75 to probably 80 is about where it's going to top out at. That's a lot of money for a Grand Cherokee and I I I just don't – I'm not sure I see the value in it. So, uh, and the other thing with the 4xE, uh, it gets about 26 miles of range. Uh, and get this, so there's three buttons on the console, right? Uh, and two of them are interesting. Uh, one is hybrid. That's probably the best. I want to say, if I remember from my research, with if your battery's dead, the Jeep gets around 23 mpg mm-hmm. uh, with a dead battery. If you've got the battery – then you're at 54 mpge, uh, if I recall right, I can or 53, up. something like that. Yeah, you yep, can look it I up. I can look it up right here. Um, I'm, I think I'm right about that. And um, you know, those numbers aren't exactly grand, right? You, you've got this issue where you're carrying around two powertrains, uh, a gas engine, and actually two electric motors, uh, and that adds a lot of weight, which also you know is bad for fuel economy. Uh, so in some ways, uh, it's an interesting vehicle, but in some ways, it's kind of um, a, a step between where the market is and where the market's going. I just, I just can't get over the price. I mean, it's it's got a lot of nice interior features, but there's certain aspects of the interior which just scream cost cutting. And if I'm paying seventy five thousand dollars for anything, I don't want to be reminded of any kind of cost cutting at the value. So I'm looking at the Jeep website right now. It looks like net price if you fully load out a Grand Cherokee with a Summit Reserve package, eighty two thousand mm. dollars. And the thing is, I mean, the question is then is like, you know, they already have the luxury end of the market taken care of with the the, the grand wagon. Yeah, why don't you just go like keep keep this thing like in the middle of the road, and if you want the fancy one, 
uh, you know, you walk in the dealership, why don't you just go with the Grand Wagoneer? Because that's a fancy one, right? That one goes up over 100000 uh, And I get it. I mean, I guess the thinking is like the uh, Grand Cherokee ends at 80 and the Grand Wagoneer starts at 80 But it just seems like they've gone too far, too fast up market. Well, then the question is, so 80, 80. But then you got the Sander Wagoneer, which starts at 57 or 58 and then goes up to 90. Like, it's just way too expensive. Um, uh, luckily, if you wanted a more affordable Grand Cherokee, you can still get one in like the mid 40s, which is going to be pretty good. Like, a Laredo is a pretty decent thing to drive around. But I do like the four body option. I just wish you could get one for 49 instead of 60. Now, styling wise, I think they did a really good job. I really like the look of it. Uh, the vehicle is comfortable, it's easy to drive. Uh, I did notice that uh, in uh, e save mode, so there's electric mode, there's e save mode, which lets you save the electric battery till like you want to sneak at the night and be quiet about it. Uh, but even in e-save mode, I noticed that it was still using the electric battery. Yes. So e is supposed to save the battery for when you want to use it. Let's say you well, want to go. Well, but, but, you was the battery completely dead? No. So what happened was I charged it up at home. Mm -hmm. and it's a 27 miles of range. Yep. And then I drove it to the office, which isn't very far. And did you push the e-save button? I did. Well, it, so there's the issue. What? I don't think it'll e-save it if it's fully charged. So if I remember right on the Wrangler, I haven't spent a lot of time on the Grand Cherokee, but the e-save only works at like 75 or 80%. Okay. So I don't think you can fully save in e-save mode Because it's yeah, completely charged. Because when I got here, it's at 25 miles of range, and I plugged it in at the office, and it did soak up some juice. So I was using the battery even in e-save mode. So I think if you go to e-save when it's – and I could be totally wrong. I could be, but I, I, I think it's like if you go into e-save at a really high percentage, it'll still run in hybrid mode. Yeah, and the problem also becomes – uh, because it's got that two-liter turbo, right, which doesn't put out a lot of uh, power for a very heavy vehicle. So I want to say that two-liter turbo is like 250 horsepower, if I'm right. Uh, I could be off on this, so don't quote me. I think you're a little off. I don't think I'm that off. Okay, so where, where are you going with this? Well, when you have the electric motors yep. adding power, I think it's 375 horsepower combined. Yep, and 470. Yeah, 470 pound-foot of torque. But at 250, when the battery's dead, that is not a lot of – I mean, if you put e-save – and you kill the battery, that thing's going to become slow and ponderous. You, sir, are incorrect. Okay, what did I do wrong? So the hybrid system in the 4 by e always saves reserve in the battery. So even if the battery is completely dead and the car is saying less than 1%, total, it's lying to you. So it keeps a reserve in the battery like a standard hybrid so that when you punch it, even if the battery's dead, you're still going to get 375 horsepower, 470 pound-feet of torque. I talked to them about this on the Wrangler 4xE because uh, I was curious. I said, you know, look, you're towing a trailer, right? The battery's dead. Um, so, so, okay, good to know. Yeah. So why doesn't e-save e-save? What's the point of having a button that says e-save? Well, I think, like I said, and I, I really, I, mean, I don't want to speculate, but I think in e-save, you can't e-save if you're at 100%. Why not? Because there's nowhere for the electricity to go. The battery's all the way. Well, so what? Don't go have it go anywhere. Just don't go into regen. Well, you, but you, <laughs> I mean, you can limit regen, but at some point. So, so you're, what you're saying is, like in an electric vehicle, and once again, we're stuck in electric, so we're going to get out this pretty <laughs> quick. But in an electric vehicle, you don't get regen when the battery's 100 percent full mm -hmm. because there's. So you just don't just don't do it. It's just confusing. Yeah. Um, you know what else is I like mean, that? I mean, what's confusing is I hit e-save and I'm driving around. And it goes 27 miles, 26 miles, 25 miles, and as a normal like. Consumer, I'd be like, this isn't working. But I think if you are at like 75% charge, it probably would right, have right. helped. If you don't know that, which most people, you walk in a Jeep right. dealership, the, the salesman's not going to say, well, when you hit e-save, it's not going to e-save until you get down to 75% of the battery, which you don't know when you're there anyway, right? Because it doesn't give you a, a percentage. If I recall, so a lot of plug-in hybrids have that feature to like e-save it for later. I don't know if there's a single one that will let you push that button when it's completely charged. I just, I, and I don't know the physics behind it, but I was, I've been in a couple others. But you see how that's confusing. Like, I think in the, even in the RAV4 Prime, if you go to push the button, it flashes a warning if it's fully charged, like battery voltage too high or something, or battery percentage too high. I could be off my rocker. All right, rocker. so there's another bottle, there's another button that says electricity. Yeah. So when you, that, that's also confusing because when you push that, you should be running on electricity only, but if you floor it a lot, it's going to switch to the engine. Yeah, so the way it works... Electricity. There should be like little asterisks on both those buttons. So there's three buttons. There's hybrid mode, right. electric mode, and e-safe. Yes. So let's, let's pretend that your battery is fully charged. Right. If you push the electric button, it's going to lock the vehicle in EV mode unless you put the throttle all the way down. 
And the reason that that happens is because if you have the throttle all the way down, the vehicle assumes that you're in a situation where you need to get out of the way of a train which is coming down the train tracks. And it can only give you maximum acceleration when the gasoline and the EV architecture is working together. So that's that's why that happens. So if you plant this, and it's just most plug-in hybrids. There's, some, some, there's also the different programming on how pedals work. Um, but a lot of them, if you push it past a button or if you push them all the way to the floor, even in electric mode, it'll turn on the gasoline engine because it thinks you're in a situation where you need to get out of the way. Because I think on electric mode, the vehicle is pretty down on power compared to hybrid mode. I want to say it's maybe a couple hundred horsepower. So I like said 250 out of that. You no, no, that. on electricity only. Oh. I think it's even oh, less, it's less than, than that. that. It's the, I think the electric mode. 100 and something, It's right? a 14, I think, kilowatt hour battery or give or take. And then it's like 144 horsepower there you go. Out, of the, out of one of them. And then the other one has like 40. So it's like 180. Yeah. So yeah, so like you push that pedal all the way down, you're only getting 150 yeah. horsepower. So that's a safety thing. In hybrid mode, what it will do is it will look at how you're driving. And if you are at a full charge, it'll typically prioritize electric driving in the city. But then if you're cruising along on the highway at 80, the car's smart enough to know this is not a good time to be running on electricity. Let's give them some gasoline so, engine to, to maximize total range. So I'm going to go two more minutes before we get off of electric vehicles. But this is, you can do a Tommy rant because you just came from the airport, right? Yeah. Uh, and we have a Mini that we take that's all electric. And you want it to plug it in because you need to charge to get home. But what happened when you got there? What vehicles were plugged into the charger? And there's only 12 chargers at DIA, believe it or not, which is crazy for uh, one of the busiest airports in the country. Well, Denver, the first thing you need to know about Denver International Airport, it is in the butthole of nowhere. It's like practically in Kansas. It's like 50 miles from any big city. Oh, they're spending a lot of time building a shopping center. Though. Yeah, I mean, it's the most ridiculous thing. We got we got Denver, and then it's like a full 45 minutes through fields to get from the airport to Denver, which is just the stupidest I, thing. I think you thank Pena for that. So it's nowhere near any major um, city. Right. So what that means is that from Boulder, I think it's like 45 miles to get from my house to the airport and that's basically all through fields and agriculture and whatever let's get to the point but my point is the airport's in the middle of nowhere so yeah. to get to, from there to there and back you I use up the whole charge. basically need the full charge right. of the mini now the reason i say it's in the middle of nowhere is there's no advantage to plugging in a phev at the airport right because to get anywhere with a phev you're going to have to run in gasoline anyways so most phevs will go 15 20 miles on a single charge which is just like why are you plugging your car in at the airport to go 15 miles on electricity before the gasoline engine has to get gone. So you get to the airport, they have the electric car charging stalls, and there's six of them right by the door. And those ones are always busy. They're always taken. There's always Teslas and stuff in there. So you're never going to get one of those. But there are a secret six way in the back corner. Yeah, as far away from the door as you can get. It's about a hundred mile walk to go from the secret six to the front entrance. But I have this little electric mini I'm driving, and I need a charge because I want to get home. So I always seek out the secret six. And recently I've been going, and there's always like four Teslas plugged in, which is fine. It's an EV charging station. And then two plug-in hybrids. I'm like, really? There was a first, I was iced out by a first-gen um, X5 hybrid, which I think goes like seven miles on a single charge or something, some ridiculously slow miles. And then a Porsche Panamera plug-in hybrid, which to be brutally honest, I didn't know they made a Porsche pl Panamera plug-in hybrid. That's how little I, I, I've heard of that car. So I basically was in a position where I was stressed about making it home because some guy in a BMW wanted a free seven miles of charge while he plugged he's, in he's, there he's at 120. for seven days, by the Level way. One. I'm sure he was there for four or five yeah, days. I, I, I'm kind of like, hey, if you've got the money for a Porsche Panamera hybrid, you probably don't need to be you know, getting free electricity at 120 so you can drive to the pay booth on electric only before the engine kicks in, right? It's, right. It's, a little, it's a little ridiculous. And that's my point with this. It's a little ridiculous. I think a majority of people with either the Wrangler 4 by or this are probably not going to use the electricity. Some will. I'm not saying everybody. People will drive it 20 miles to work and plug it in at work. But I think a lot of them will just eventually, over time, just completely forget about it, leave it in hybrid mode, and fill it up with gas. Which is then the worst of both worlds because then you're carrying around this extra battery and two electric motors for you know no reason, basically. I think that's a little pessimistic. Your That's what's happening in Germany with yeah, all their but hybrids. Yeah, Ger but Germany's kind of a... And they've got charging stations up the wazoo. Germany is... We, ha we have, you know, 12 stalls barely at the second or third busiest airport in America. Germany's very gas... gas... 
pro gas. So, but um, the, the, there needs to be an etiquette system where if it's EV charging, reserve it for EVs, and then maybe have a separate bank for plug-in hybrids. Yeah. Like have a PHEV bank. That, I think that's a good idea. There's a reason that most PHEVs, first of all, don't have fast charging. Because you're not yeah, supposed called, to be... It's called the gas station. Yeah. Well, you're not supposed to be fast charging a PHEV. I think there's only realistically one on the market which just went away, which was the Outlander plug-in hey, hybrid. Hey, let's let's end this. People are so sick of EVs. That was important. I'm getting tired of them. It's it's the future. It's coming. There's gonna be people throwing fists. Now I could have this. I did contemplate this, because there there was the the six EV stalls. You could have unplugged one of them. I could have unplugged that Porsche and backed it next to it, but what's the etiquette there? You know, because there's a good chance, the other thing about plugging in at the airport, there's a good chance that Porsche was plugged in for seven days and got fully charged in the first three hours. All right. All right. Let's, let's just wrap up the, uh, the Grand so Cherokee. So maybe I should have done that. But then what if you get keyed? The Grand Cherokee is a good car. It's a good family hauler. If it was my choice, I'd stay away from the top of the line. I'd get the Laredo. I think you'll be very happy with that. But you can't get the PHEV in the Laredo. I'm just, that's, I, you know, at this Would point. Would you get the gasoline one? Yeah, I get the gasoline Laredo. It's right in the sweet spot. You get all the off-road goodies. We're going to take ours off-road. Ours is trail rated, so I can't wait to try it off-road. Um, it's got air suspension. It's got all these cool, uh, maybe I'll be, you know, more impressed with it off-road. But right now, it just seems, especially with what's happening in the economy, it seems a little uh, expensive. Uh, and a little over the top for, for a brand that is kind of, you know, in the heart of America, uh, every man and woman shopping. All maybe, right? Maybe we need a note system, like a, bring a sticky pad places, you know? I've had that happen. We're like, hey, I unplugged your car. So what's number 19? It was fully charged. This is actually a really smart thing. The Nissan Leaf had it right. It had those little dots on the dashboard, so everybody knew how charged Are your car was. Are we at 18? No, we're at um, 18. All right, what's number 18? It's 25.9 days in the lot. It's the Toyota Camry with an average transaction price of $31,000. There's nothing we can say about the Toyota Camry that hasn't been said, so go on to the next one. Um, number 17 is the Mercedes GLE. Interesting. 24.7 days on the lot with an enormously high transaction price of $75,240. So that is a, the kind of medium large. Wait, $75,000? Yeah. So it's the same price as the as the Grand Cherokee. Yeah. That well, kind of makes, yeah. kind of makes my point. Yes. I agree. 24.7 days on the lot. Now, number 16 is a big surprise because yeah. this is a car that gets a lot of kind of hate online, but I actually like this thing a lot. It's the Chevrolet Trailblazer. So clearly a car that's moving off lots pretty that's quickly. That's a small one, right? Or is that the big that's one? That's the little baby one. That's a little baby one. That's a cute one. It's actually okay off-road. Well, people didn't like it because the first Trailblazer was this big, giant thing. Yeah, it was. It would compete with the Bronco. No. You're the Blazer. The, Blazer. Blazer. Yeah, the first the Trailblazer. Trailblazer was... The uh, our video for Ian has one. It's yeah, that like, yeah, comfor yeah, 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 yeah. comfortable. It's just a family hauling SUV. It's kind of like think, a Durango. I don't think he has it anymore. He had it. Oh no, he, they still have they it. Have they don't lot. sell cars. Yeah, yeah it never gets. Rid you know that car had an inline six, the, the old Trailblazer. That is badass. Well, I don't know if that's the right word for it, but it's it kind is. of an interesting footnote. The straight sixes, for a while, there were only like two straight sixes you could buy in America. Everybody went to a V6, right? I don't know if the GM 4200 is what I would call a badass engine. But, but I'm <laughs> saying, after, for a while, like the Cummins was the only straight six you could buy. No. Yeah. No. Yes, BMW, except for BMW, there were two. Until five years ago, there were only two straight sixes on the American market. The Cummins and the BMW, everybody else went away from the straight six. They all went to V6s. I am not making that up. You can fact check no, me all you true. want. No, it's true. But that's still like oh, there are a lot of BMWs that had straight sixes. Now they yeah they came back. They, the, the straight six is making a comeback. Thank God because it's we know this. It's the smoothest, most refined way of placing cylinders. It's also a, a, an engine block. Terribly problematic. Well, it's long. I mean, yeah. It creates this beautiful long hood. Gives you a cool design. Yeah, but manufacturers don't want long hoods. They want affordable packaging. Well, now they do. Now they run them back. And then what you end up with, like the they're so long. In fact, like Mercedes and their new straight sixes, they don't even have belts on the front of their engine and pulleys. They I had know. to go to all electric because it's it too cool, long. Though. Once again, innovation in the gasoline. That's, that's a lot of complicated technology, though. We I think know. a belt and a pulley seems more ten, simple. Ten, ten years from now. Well, no. I think I think I have an idea. All right, I just, well, all right, it's a cool car. Let's just say it's a cool car. I like it. People give it a lot of grief. The old Trailblazer or the new, new one? The new one. I think it's a good car. So remember how you're saying people really like the Jeep Wrangler Unlimited Hybrid? Yeah. Well, number 15 is the standard non-hybrid. Yeah, the Wrangler just... So but isn't that interesting? So maybe it's not as... I mean, obviously it's on the list, the hybrid, but the standard one is moving off the lots faster than the hybrid. Because you can't probably get the hybrid. They're hard to get. Well, this is just time on lot, though. So it's saying once it shows up to the lot, how long does it take to move? I, I, you know, I, I appreciate this list for my C cars. I got a feeling that 
in the real world, um, especially with a Wrangler, you order it or you get lucky because your friend is a dealer or you, like one of our recent listeners did, follow the truck with the Wrangler to the dealership and buy it as soon as they unload it. Uh, so the interesting thing is, so 24.1 days for the Wrangler Unlimited, average transaction price $55,000, which is almost exactly the $7,500 tax credit difference between the Wrangler Unlimited and the Wrangler Plug-in Hybrid. Hmm, I wonder how that happened, huh? Yeah, interesting what a, how what that What a coincidence works. that is. So would you get the Plug-in Hybrid or the standard one? On the Wrangler? Yeah. I'd get the Plug-in Hybrid on the Wrangler. I like the, I, I, we had it, I really liked it. Um, I, I like the fact, you know why I like off-roading where you're just listening to like the brook and the sound of the suspension. Uh, it's actually kind of cool. So I do, I would do definitely do the plug-in hybrid for that one. It, it just, it just seems so like out of place to have such a big, heavy, uh, and I like things that are weird and I like things that are out of place, such a big, heavy car driving down or up, let's say Webster Pass or Red Cone in perfect silence. I think that's so cool. Don't you think there's kind of a lot going on though? It's kind of a, and it's a really, well, okay, good point. really, really, really heavy. Okay, so, so let's talk about this, right? Um, we keep a car, we just sold a whole bunch of them, by the way. We keep a car for a year, maybe, because, mm-hmm. you know, we want to review it and move on. And actually, the recently, in trucks, we haven't kept them that long. Um, so for me, it's not an issue, but I completely understand that if you're, you know, putting your hard-earned money on this car and you're going to keep it for the next 10 years, then it might be an issue. Well, statistically, people don't keep cars that long, though. Yeah, but some do. Some, some people, people do. Like Ian, like you said, he never sells them. Yeah, but... Uh, There's some people who never sell cars, too. Um, like to, yeah, they they I drive just, into the ground. I don't know. I mean, I could have... Well, which one would you get? Well, it's just... A well, we know of, that. You bought the, the Willys. Yeah, it's also just a lot of weight. I mean, you get a lot of weight in that plug-in hybrid. Mm-hmm. I mean, so this is where plug-in hybrid... This is a fun thing. So fuel economy is obviously hugely important right now. Well, so so now that there's a competitor to it, you could you know bring the B word into the conversation again, and I mean the Bronco. And if you want a uh, all electric experience, there's no Bronco equivalent. So I'm just going on the no uh, foreigner equivalent. No, no, there's there's none of the, that. The closest you're going to get is maybe a Rivian. Here's where you really have to start paying attention to your driving habits, though. So I've got on the fueleconomy.gov website, let me, this is going to be a fun comparison. So I've got the 2022 Jeep Wrangler 4xe pulled up, and then the 2022 Jeep Wrangler um, Unlimited with just the standard 2 liter. So we've got the plug-in hybrid 2 liter, and we've got the standard 2 liter. Now, this is where the plug-in hybrid equation falls apart. You get 22 miles of all-electric range on the plug-in hybrid. Obviously, it's going to be super cheap to run. Right. right, because uh, if you charge up at home, electricity is much cheaper than gasoline. However, once you run out of gasoline after 22 miles, the combined fuel economy is 20 mpg running on gasoline. Yeah. And the combined fuel economy on a normal gasoline Wrangler 2-liter four-door, 22. So 20 mpg on the hybrid, 22 on the standard one. So if you're driving a lot over a long distance, it makes more sense to get the non-hybrid model because you're not carrying around dead batteries. So, um, yeah, you can see this look on my face. I am just... No, but it's true. It's you, very you, you, you are. I love, you, I love you for the fact that you are completely geeking out on this, but all I can think about right now, Tommy, is people buy Wranglers, and the first thing they do is they dump the standard tire and they throw on, you know, 35, 37s, and there's not a single thought given to fuel economy because throwing on 37s is going to take that 20 number and take it down to, like, 13. Yeah. So, so I don't think that's, a, that's an equation it's, most people care about. I think it e- is. Even at $5 a gallon. I don't think they care about that. That's such a lifestyle vehicle. So to them, fuel economy, if you're buying a Wrangler, you don't don't buy a Wrangler for fuel economy. Just don't, right? You buy it because you want to make a statement. I'm outdoorsy, or you buy it because you want to go outdoors and explore the world. But if you're buying it for fuel economy, go get yourself you know, a Prius. That's a really good view that people had in like 1979. <laughs> it's true. People are like, oh, you buy your CJ7 because you're going to go out exploring in the wilderness. Bring your fishing pole. I didn't say, I, I, I didn't say that's why necessarily people buy them. I'm just saying people who buy them don't give a rat's but they do about because, fuel economy. Because they, they buy them because they want to be perceived as adventurous and outdoorsy and they want the Wrangler lifestyle. But what's going to keep them in the Wrangler and what's going to decide whether or not they're going to buy another one is stuff like maintenance. It's stuff like fuel economy. It's stuff like running costs. I think, I think actually the, the, 
Wrangler is so iconic that it transcends all of those things. Oh, it does not transcend it does, the economy. Yeah, it does. Because it does not. Oh, yes, it does. Eventually, it may not. But look, you're, you're driving a brick into the wind, right? The, 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 let's face it. The, the seating position in that thing is nose in the windshield. You know, it's got it's got a minimal amount of like creature comforts for the most part, right? And yet people are you know lining up to buy them. It's it's it, it transcends all those kind of mundane. How much fuel economy am I getting? You know, how does it last? How, all those questions that normally people would put to a Camry, which was on the list. This is completely like 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 a, an aside. It's, you, it's, an, it's a complete outlier. Would you agree that people are daily driving the Wranglers? Hell yeah. Of course. Then they care about fuel economy. I don't think so. I really do. Because here's the thing. Um, people don't care. They want the look. They want the aesthetic. But they're going to complain when the gas hits $6 Yeah, they'll a complain, gallon. but they won't care. Oh. I, they will. They'll sell them. They will sell them. In a normal market, this market is a crazy car market. All right. Okay. Once again, let me, let me give you some facts and stats that disprove what you're saying. Be, before this market went all haywire, right? Yeah. What were the two... Uh, in Colorado specifically, and that's different, of course. Colorado's different than like Florida, but what were the two vehicles with the highest resale? Uh, the Wrangler and the Tacoma. Exactly, yeah. But that was also when gas was way cheaper. Gas was very, very cheap but before I'm, the market uh, but went But you crazy. see, and you're saying, you're saying we return to a normal market. I'm saying any, even in a normal market. But this, th that was a normal market with affordable gas prices. This is starting to return to a normal uh, look, market you, with $5 a you gallon. You would think when gas reached 5 or $6 a gallon, people would be dumping Wranglers like left and right. You go by the, any Jeep dealership, there, are, you know, there are no Wranglers because you can't lot. because they're not building; they can't buy them. But I'm saying even, but there's not even used one. People are not dumping their Wranglers even with five or six. It's an outlier. It's a whole different. You cannot apply the standard metrics to a Wrangler. It's just a different vehicle. I think you can. I really do. And you know, here's the other thing to keep in mind: it, it was the only vehicle in its class for 27 years, 25 right. years. If you wanted that open top American freedom, you bought a Wrangler. But now they can't think like that. They have to evolve because now you have the Bronco breathing down their neck. So, so I, I, I would have agreed with that logic, but the, the latest numbers and facts I saw is that uh, the Bronco isn't getting conquest sales from Wrangler owners. Yeah, you sound like Alex Dykes. No, I'm not. That's that's what that's not what's happening. The, the Wrangler is still selling, and then there's so much pent up demand for these vehicles uh, that you, you know people aren't necessarily uh, switching from a Wrangler to a Bronco. There's enough demand for both of them. The numbers of Wranglers sold are still astronomically high, and the numbers of Broncos sold are astronomically high. There's just so much pent up demand for these kind of lifestyle vehicles. I think at some point it may you know it may change. For someone like you and I, we understand how aerodynamics work. We understand you're driving a vehicle with solid axles and 33 inch tall tires, and it's not designed to get fuel economy. But I think a lot of Wrangler buyers don't understand that. They just don't. I mean, you go to like the CU campus, and they're everywhere. Wranglers are absolutely everywhere, and people do love them, but. When gas starts getting expensive, it's harder and harder to justify the compromise of a Wrangler. And the other thing, too, which they're going to have to fix, and I am an old-school off-road guy, but I understand the writing on the wall, they have to fix the on-road dynamics. Because it's true, the on-road dynamics of a Wrangler are pretty bad. They're just not what they need to be in 2022. They got away with it a long time, but the Bronco is such a better thing to drive on the road. It's got better steering. It's got a better ride quality. It's got better seats. The Wrangler needs to come into the 21st century. All right. Well, we've beaten that horse to the ground, so let's go to number 14. But this is also interesting. You just last let thing. Go. No, it's very interesting. Let the it go. last important thing comparing the gasoline Wrangler uh -huh. to the plug-in hybrid. Uh -huh. The total range on the plug-in hybrid, electric and gas, yeah. 370 miles. Yeah. The total range on the gas only? 473. There you go. So now you've got all the facts if you want to geek out. So would it. you still get the plug-in hybrid yes. after my yes. rational arguments? Yes, I would. I don't Ugh. care. I don't care. If, you, if As long as the vehicle has 300 miles of range, everything else is just uh, uh, cake, and I don't care if it's 350 or 400. The only time I care about that is when a truck, when I'm towing, then uh, fuel uh, tank size becomes a huge deal. But in a car, I'm usually not towing. I don't care. Mm. Right? I, I mean, I like not having to do the gas pump as much, but it, it's not a huge deal. All right, what's number 14? You don't think some people care about fuel tank size? Yeah, I'm sure people do. Like my mom. I'm saying me. My mom despises filling up her gas my tank. My wife, you mean? Yeah, same thing. <laughs> oh, they, she hates filling up her gas tank more than anything in the world. Yeah. And her um, X5 does like 
450 miles on a single tank. It's ridiculous. It just keeps going and going and going and going. But she still has to fill it and up. She, but yeah, but less frequently. And right. she loves that about go, go, go to number 14. Uh, number 14 is the Nissan Kicks. 23.7. No, that's a surprise. Days on the lot. I guess it's it's affordable and it's a crossover. Those are the only two things you need to know about it. Yeah, and it's probably pretty gettable. Yeah. Um, number 13 is the RAV4 Hybrid. Toyota, 23.7 days. Average transaction price, 36767 I bet you the Prime's farther down the list. Prime is not on the list. Okay, well, there you go. Yeah. The hybrid, well, that's, you know, the that makes sense. The RAV4 is the best-selling car in America right now. It surpassed uh, uh, the Camry, so I could see why that would be number 13. Number 12 is the Kia Sportage, which was recently fully redone. 22.9 days on the lot, $33,967 transaction. Yeah, good car. Good car, yeah. I like that. We just yeah. had the, yeah. I just took it. Just took it off road, the X Pro. It's pretty cool. Uh, going to number 11, uh, same kind of realm, more or less, as a Subaru Outback. 22.9 days on the lot. Average transaction price nearly 38 grand. So people are spending a lot on Outbacks. Subaru doesn't lend us cars, so I'm not going to give them any love either. Well, they're number one, so we're going to have to. You just gave um, it away. I didn't give away the model, just the brand. I I'm just saying, if Subaru is so, uh, you know, so stuck on their uh, hate of TFL that even after I apologized and I said, bury the hatchet, let's bury the hatchet, and they couldn't come back to us and, like, you know, use it as an opening to, to hopefully uh, get on the most popular uh, YouTube channel um, for cars. Well, one of the most popular for cars. Yeah, it's not, not the most popular, but That would be big. truck. The truck channel is the most popular truck channel for new truck reviews on YouTube. Our car is like one of five. And our off-road channel is also kicking butt. But if, 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 if they don't care about that, then I'm not giving them any love. Subaru, sorry, my mouth is sealed. Well, I like the Outback quite a bit. I think it's quite a nice what car. Is an out, what, what is the Outback? Isn't that someplace in Australia? No, it's a good car. Is it? I, I thought it was like someplace in yeah, Australia where you go. It, I know like I know we have our past with Subarus, but they do, they do build a very solid product. Just because the PR I, team I, we have a sticky relationship with, I think that um, the, the cars okay, themselves uh, uh, are really very good. I've driven some of the new Outback. Especially the wilderness is very, very good. Um, so number 10 is the Hyundai Tucson Hybrid. 22.3 days on the market. $36,371 transaction price. Um, Tucson Hybrid, also pretty recently refreshed, similar to the Sportage. Very good car. Very angular. Kind of a funky design. Uh, it's got this crazy new engine, a 1.6 liter turbo with a six-speed automatic and a, and a hybrid system. It's very impressive for what it is. Well, let's take a break and let's talk about some of the other cars at the office uh, while we're uh, going down the list. Uh, now, I just got, me and you just drove in in the new Acura MDX. Type S. Uh, Type S. Yep. What do you think of it? So the Type S is the sporty version of the three-row crossover. And it's not, it's, it's not quite up to like X5M levels of, of kind of performance. But it is quite a good car, I think, for... What you're buying, it's got the twin turbo V6, which is a zesty little engine, but it does a good job of kind of having a dual personality where you can really tone it down and make it a comfortable cruiser. Or if you put it in the right mode and stomp on it, it goes pretty darn good. I like the interior a lot, the beautiful design, best steering wheel in the industry. Really pretty poor infotainment system. Still don't like Acura's infotainment system. I was blown away by it. I got it, the thing, Tommy, and I was like, wow, this is going to be complicated to figure out how to make everything work because it has those side bolsters and they were way too tight for me, right? Uh, and it's just not very uncomfortable. Uh, and then within a second, I was able to figure out uh, how to release those. It had the uh, uh, steering assist where it vibrates the steering wheel when you go across the yellow line. I hate that, right? I just don't want to be reminded of that. I Within two clicks, I was able to figure out how to how to turn that off. Very intuitive. Uh, my only complaint with that, and it's a it's a big one, unfortunately, is infotainment. It's very hard to use. Uh, I mean, this is a this is a, a, an issue that obviously has been around for a while. But it's a magnificent car. Just uh, you know, change the infotainment. Make a touchscreen. Maybe it, touchscreen would solve it. It could be a little faster. So it's well, be a little the, 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 the pad just doesn't work uh, in a car. No, no, I mean the car, car itself could oh, be Oh, the quicker. car. I didn't find any problems with the speed. I thought it was fine. Yeah, but it's a Type S. Yeah. Like Type S is like the go fast one. It's got quad exhaust. So you're looking for like an X6M. Not that much. Okay. No, that's too so, insane. All right, like an, but like it, a, a, it only has 355 horsepower, which should be really good in a TLX Type S. 
but in an MDX Type S, it's just not quite enough for the size of the vehicle for what should be the, the hottest uh, version. Hey, look, I, I took it uh, to the Nissan dealership because we just sold our FJ. Uh, if you want to see that video, alltfl.com. Uh, it's a sad day. I'm kind of bummed about that. Uh, we're trying to raise money for our next truck. But uh, even like one of the salesmen came out and I was like, wow, that's a good looking car. Even he was like walking around it. Uh, it's got one of the biggest emblems of an automaker out of any car outside of the old Volkswagen bus. I mean, that thing is like the size of a pie tin on the front of it. And it actually works. They got rid of that beak. Uh, and they got the, it's got these very like uh, modular, uh, almost, um, I don't want to use, it's, the, the squinty is not the right word. It would be like uh, mm, linear headlights. Uh, it's just, it's a very good looking car. I think they, they just knocked out the ballpark with that one exception. I even, I even didn't, I'm not even complaining and whining about the push button transmission, which I normally hate. It is a very comfortable car, I think. Uh, just wish it was a little bit more sporty for the Type S. So you can get like also the A spec, which is a standard Acura MDX, and there I don't I'm not really quite sure there's a big enough um, distinguishing dis distinguishable presence between the A spec and the Type S. So I Fair wish enough. it was a little bigger. Yeah. But uh, yeah, seventy thousand dollars or thereabouts to buy. I've got a video over at TL Car, which I did back in March, where we um, basically drove it around, and I did a pretty quick, cool review with it. So check that out if you want more information. I was, it was my first time in the car. I was highly impressed with it. I thought they did a hell of a good job. So number nine on the list with an average time on a lot of 21.5 days, which is more than I thought, and an average transaction price of 57.5, which is more than the Bronco four-door, more than the Wrangler four-door, is the Ford Bronco. So that's number nine. Ooh, it beat the Wrangler. Number nearly $58,000 transaction. What, what can we say about the Bronco that hasn't been said, right? It's, well, sure. I mean, uh, we just we just actually, if you're listening to this, uh, on this week's Taming Tumbleweed, uh, we had a guy by the name of TJ come out uh, to the ranch in his Badlands with the smaller powertrain and take on the hard pond course. And you know what he said, which was interesting, Tommy? Yeah. He said, when you watch this thing on video, it looks really easy. But when you actually get behind the wheel, you notice how steep the hills are and how difficult the course is. So that was really good uh, to hear. And, and actually, I had an idea, and I wanted to run this by you in real time. Uh, and let, let us know in the comments below if you like this idea. I thought if people come out and run uh, the course, we should put together a really nice certificate and say, you know, I've completed the TFL off-road pond course and give them, you know, number it, which number they are, you know, I'm number five to complete the course, and I only got stuck or I didn't get stuck. What do you think about that? And give them a nice little, as a thank you for coming out. Love it. Okay, we'll do it. Oh, good. There you go. Um, number eight on the list is the BMW X3. Uh, average time on lot, 19.4 days. That's one of those cars I think that is like right in the sweet spot of where the size of that thing should be, right? It's kind of the entry level. Uh, I mean, I know there's an X2 and an X1, but I'm saying in terms of size-wise for America, it's gotten much bigger than the original X3, and so now it's more like the original X5 in terms of size. So if you want an entry into the luxury segment for a crossover, that's a really good car. Yeah, so um, $52,000 um, typical transaction price. So pretty... Pretty uh, high, I think, for an X3, but everything's expensive nowadays, so that's kind of how it goes. And number seven on the list, proving that affordable cars still sell like crazy, the Kia Forte, coming in at 18.6 days on the lot, so pretty big drop, $23,000, uh, average transaction price. Haven't driven a Forte in a long time. I think they just refreshed it, didn't they? Yeah, you know, your, your grandparents, my folks had a restaurant in the Chicago area, the Czech restaurant. If you ever go to the Bohemian Crystal that belonged to my folks, I used to work there all the time in Westmont. Um, I think they're selling it actually. I don't know. Anyway, uh, we, we sold it to our manager like 25 years ago. Uh, but uh, uh, my dad used to have a saying and he was absolutely true. And, and he, you know, he lived and worked in the restaurant business through some of the more serious recessions that we had in this country, which is timely right now. Uh, but he used to say, you, you'll always do well in the restaurant business if you serve good food at inexpensive prices. And I think you can take that uh, to the car business. You will always do well in the car business if you sell good cars or maybe reliable cars for affordable prices. And that's what this car is. It's just a solid little car that will always sell. It's a good beginner car. Uh, it's a good, uh, you know, secondhand car. It's just a, it's just a, a car that a lot of people will always want. Now, something interesting. So it starts at nineteen grand, um, but the cool one in the spec is actually you can get the Kia Forte in a model called the GT Manuals, twenty-four grand. 
25 grand starting. But the GT manual actually has a turbocharged 1.6 liter engine, a multi-link rear suspension, and a six-speed stick, which is a lot of fun. So that's kind of the enthusiast tip of the day. If you want a fun car for not a lot of money and you don't want to like spend a lot for a type or a, like a Veloster N or a Elantra N, Forte GT. It's a good car. Yeah, good, good tip. All right. Um, what number are we up to? Six. Okay. Kia Telluride, 18.6 days, $46,000 transaction price on average, which is actually a lot lower than I thought because Tellurides are typically way over sticker on um, MSRP. Yeah, th- th- there's a couple cars up now that are just uh, hot and remain hot. And I'll give you I'll give you the ones that I know of, okay? This is one of them. Of course, the Palisade uh, is also another one, right? The twin to this car. Uh, once again, seven person, three row, affordable with the interior of a much more expensive car. Interesting styling. Just There's just about everything about it is is good. I'm not in love with the V6. I think it's a little thirsty and it's a little boring, but otherwise magnificent cars. The other car that defies gravity right now is the uh, Chevy Corvette, right? It's been out for three years and there's still unobtainium. Incredible. I was on Craigslist as I am just poking around. Not that I'm buying anything because we're selling stuff, but you know, I'm still seeing like used... Corvettes, uh, C8 selling for 10, 20, 30 above sticker, uh, and that's pretty amazing. So I don't know if it's you know supply chain issues or if it's you know GM on purpose keeping production low, but there's still an incredible amount of demand for the Corvette even after it's been out a while. And forget about the Z06, right? That that's complete unobtainium. So yeah, um, unless you're Corvette, unless you're street speed. Corvette is not on the list. Um, Congratulations, Street Speed. But, you deserve it. Uh, it's very. Very good car. You're 100% right about the Corvette. Um, the other one that's like that, that's kind of under the radar but does really well, is the Carnival, the little minivan. Carnival is also very yeah, good. The yep. Carnival is also really, really good. So um, you're not going to like the top five. All right, before we get to that, let's talk about the Mazda. What What are your thoughts on the Mazda? Because I don't have a lot of thoughts. CX-50. So yeah. it's the new, um, like, smallest crossover from Mazda. It basically raised the CX-30, right? No, CX-5, sorry. Mm, I think it's more in line with the CX-30 okay, on the so, platform. So they like raised the CX-30. No, it's it's <laughs> it's a little bit more than that. So it basically it's a new model. So Mazda has this thing they've been doing now where they've got like their core models, the CX-3, the CX-5, and the CX-7. Yeah. Or sorry, CX-9. Uh, but those now are being replaced by new versions of them, but not a new CX-3 and a CX-5. But they replace the CX-30 more or less. Uh, they replaced the CX-3 more or less with the CX-30. Wouldn't it be cool if they had names for cars? And now they're replacing the CX-5 more or less with the CX-50. How about if the, you know, they had like the Mazda Seal, the Mazda Walrus, the Mazda, I'm just thinking oceans now, the Mazda Whale, right? That would be so much easier than CX-30, CX, it's just confusing. So they went kind of Subaru on us with the CX-50. It's got a little bit of extra cladding. It's yeah. got a little bit more ground clearance. It's got a turbocharged engine, the one we drove, Signature Plus. And it was a lovely, lovely car. They did a fantastic job with it. I think it's a little expensive. But I think the one we were in was mid forty thousand dollar range. Yeah. But the interior is incredible. It's got lots of good safety gear. It's got a really powerful engine. Good all wheel drive system. It's got a great design to it. I was yeah, very impressed with it. Yeah, the infotainment's still tricky. But it does now have wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and apparently you can control CarPlay via touchscreen, which mm. is nice. So, loved the CX-50. I thought it was the most premium in its class. It's kind of in this weird space where it's like a little bigger than the CX-5. So does it compete with like uh, a Toyota um, RAV4 or does it compete with the new Venza? Like it's kind of this interesting size thing. But if you want a fun car with a little bit of off-road chops and um, a great interior. Hey, Mazda, better late than never. You finally got on the uh, crossover bandwagon. Uh, well, they've been on it for a while. They've been killing it. I mean, the CX-30 is a great car. Uh, they've been, you know, they just, CX-3 wasn't very good. CX-30 is good, though. It wasn't that long since they were selling the MX-6, right? It, it, they just recently killed that thing. So MX-6? That was like 1990. What was, what was the sedan? <laughs> what, what was the sedan? Mazda 6. Oh, Mazda 6, sorry. MX-6. Well, that's the same thing, it right? It is not the same thing. I mean, it's, it, it, the MX-6 became the Mazda 6. Uh, yeah, it became... Yeah. I don't think it did, actually. The, the MX-6 was a sports car. Was it? All right, never mind. I'm getting old. 1997 is the wow. last time there was wow. an MX-6, wow. in case you're wondering. Whoa, ouch. They just killed it 25 years ago. I, I, I like how you make me feel old, Tommy. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I have not thought about an MX-6 in weeks. That's how long I haven't thought about one. Basically, the year you were born. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. The Mazda 6 is what recently died. That was a big sedan. Um... And I don't know if it's going to be replaced. There were like talks about doing like um, 
were the rumors about? Um, anyway, I don't want to speculate. I'm but saying they, they they weren't exactly the first on the on the crossover bandwagon, and it took them a while to figure out that this is what people wanted. Yeah, but they figured it out pretty quick, and they uh, they're doing a great job with it. CX-5 is an excellent excellent vehicle, and the CX-50 is even better. I got to tell you, I was kind of meh. Well, you didn't you didn't drive it right. I did drive. I was kind of meh. I was like, it's yeah, good car. Just an, it's got a, it's styled well. It's quick. Uh, uh, it's got but, a good engine. Yeah, but not very fuel efficient. Not but very there's fuel not efficient. like there's no there's nothing like that that would that, there's no innovation in the thing. But that, in that class, I don't know if people want innovation. They want comfortable, reliable cars to get them to work. I always want innovation. What you know? What sets it apart from uh, a Rav Four? Well, it's much better on the inside. It's better I'm not, styled. I don't think it's better on the inside. Oh, it's better on the inside. That oh, interior I, is incredible. I don't know. I mean, I know they're trying to go off market, uh, you know, with their. Uh, okay, so what's the best selling car in, in the U.S.? It's the Rav Four, right? Yeah. A car with almost no innovation. So I don't think. No, people, that's absolutely not true. Well, the Rav Four Prime has yes. it, but that's a tiny percentage of Rav Four sales. And no, teeny weeny. It's it's a teeny weeny percentage because they can't build enough. Yeah, but that's the problem. They have the but it's got, it's, it's got innovation. It's not that innovative, the RAV4, Dad. It's like the Camry. The Camry is also one of the best-selling cars in the U.S., and that's got almost no innovation. They're great cars, fantastic things, very reliable, very well-made, now nice and comfortable. Actually, I disagree. The TRD, uh, was it the, what's the racing version? The, the, the TRD Camry? Yeah. What, you stick a spoiler on a car and now it's innovative? It's cool. It's not it's innovative, cool. though. It's a spoiler it's in a body cool. kit. It's cool. No, it's, it, they also uh, made it's, it a little bit it's cool. stiffer. No, it is. It is. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they, they made a sedan and they made it fast and fun. Uh, it's innovation. Um, you know, like I say, I'm with the Mazda, I'm kind of like meh. I was like, I drove it. I'm like, yeah, okay, the, I get it. But what is the Camry innovative? The Camry TRD. It's a good car. It's, it's reasonably quick. It's reasonably well-priced. But they put a spoiler on a Camry. It's no, not no, innovative. No, no. They, I think it's more than that. They made it handle really well. Well, they, it's still a front-wheel drive stand. I mean, for what it is, it's pretty impressive. And they gave it a lot of impressive. horsepower? It's not a Hellcat Challenger. No, but they get... All right, anyway, once again, we're arguing. Keep going. Go innovative. On. What's number five? I think. Well, you're going to have an aneurysm on the last five because three of them are Subarus. Should uh, we keep going? No, I'm just not going to comment. Okay, number five is the Subaru Impreza. 18.5 days on the lot. Average transaction price, 24881 Uh It's the most affordable Subaru you can buy. It's, um, I, my friend of mine just bought one. It's not a great thing to drive. It's not super fast, but it's good value and offers good standard safety technology. Number four is the Honda CRV, 17.7 days on the lot. Average transaction price, nearly thirty-five grand. Just a direct competitor to the RAV4. Another car with not a lot of innovation. Well, the new one. Have they released a new one? Uh, yeah, sure. We were, wasn't Case there? Case went to the... Yeah. To the, oh, yeah, yeah. They, they, <laughs> no, I wasn't sure if the embargo had lifted yet. Yeah, did, that's right. They did. They did, did you forget from 1997, Tommy? Yeah, that's right. No, I just, like, got to make sure we're, we're keeping our ducks see, in the row. See, see, it's it's not that, you know, speaking for an hour and 14 minutes and, you know, not making a mistake is not as easy no, as it sounds. No, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I just, the MX-6 was like a funny, that was a very specific mistake. I thought that was great. No, you're right. I forgot that the embargo already lifted on that. Yeah, the new one looks pretty cool. I like the way they, they designed it. Um, should we go number three? Sure. Number three on the list is a Subaru Forester, 14.7 days on the lot. So three days less than the CRV, 34319 bucks. It's, uh, once again, great way to get all-wheel drive, pretty good safety tech. Um, and then there's the new Wilderness trim. Number two is the Civic, 14.1 days, recently redesigned, 26480 Yeah, I get to drive the Type R. woo -hoo! I yeah, but wait. the standard, even the standard Civic's good. Um, I like that 1.6. I think it's one of the best. I think the 1.6 turbo. 1.5. 1.5 turbo is yeah. one of the best. Uh, is it 1.5? I think it's 1.5. I don't know. I thought it was 1.6. I it think it's 1.5. Yeah. I think you're right. It's one of those two. Hey, what's a 0 0.10 liter between friends? 0.1. Uh, yeah, 1.5. It's 15.99. 1.5. Um, yeah, fourteen point good cars. The C, even the CVT one's pretty good to drive. The new Civic is a little bit more conservative than the previous generation. They keep kind of vacillating between going boyhood racer to gentleman driver. Uh, and sometimes I wish that uh, maybe that's a strategy. Uh, I remember when I was growing up in Chicago, uh, there was a restaurant chain called Let Us Entertain You, and they figured out, I think, that they also did that Devix. I think that was Let Us Entertain You chain. A lot of restaurant talk today. I think they, they figured out that, like, a restaurant has this, like, you know, lifespan where at first when it opens up, people are super excited, and then after a while, the theme starts to get old, and then then there's a slow decline, a slow burn of revenue until it kind of flattens out. And so whatever point that is at, seven years or ten years, they would remodel the restaurant. If it was a, it was one called like Jonathan Livingston Seagull or Seafood, I think, if, and if it's a fish restaurant, it turned into a steak restaurant. Uh, and that's, I think, what Honda's doing. They kind of vacillate between, like I said, gentleman driver and boyhood racer. I kind of feel like they'd do better just to pick a theme and stick with it. 
Okay, that's an interesting point. And then number one on the list with an average time on the lot of just 12.9 days and a 12.9 days and an average transaction price of $30,299. We've got the Subaru Crosstrek, which is a car we owned. Two of our employees have them and they are, uh, you can't throw a protein smoothie shake in Boulder without hitting one, but they're not very fast even in the sport model. Um, but they do offer a lot of kind of rugged good looks, a lot of pretty good tech, very good comfort, and decent fuel economy at a low price. I'll say something about their car. The McDonald's of crossovers. Yes, it's very consistently the, good. The number one <laughs> meal yeah, of crossovers. Yeah, it's a Big Mac and small crossovers. It's very, very just safe and comfortable, but uh, you still have like the cool sound of the little flat four. So, yeah, it's a great car. It probably deserves to be at the top. Um, Wasn't there one more car that we had at the office that we were going to review? You said four at the beginning. Uh, yeah, we had the Pathfinder Rock Creek. Yeah, yeah, we did. A, you took it off road. Yeah, uh, people, so people, by the way, were curious as to how much it cost. No idea. Because I, I think you omitted the price. Because they didn't tell me. Well, you can look it up. No, they, they, it's not released yet. It isn't released? No, there's no pricing on it. Well, you should have said that. that well, was, I apologize. Every other comment was how much. People, yeah, it hasn't been announced. Really? Yeah, there's no pricing. All right. Yeah, so I don't I don't know how much it costs. So um, basically, they they uh, ruggedize the Pathfinder, right? They put on and I love it actually. They put on some all terrains, uh, and I, you know it's funny in the new Colorado, people are getting sick of, uh, or at least some of the comments where people are sick of this off road trend, and maybe we've reached the top of that wave, and now we're going to go the other direction, you know, more uh, urban and less uh, country or off road. Uh, but I do like the Rock Creek edition, you know. Uh, Fat knobby tires, a little bit more cladding, uh, and and the Pathfinder, at least from my experience, is actually very good off road. And they went back to their uh, more off road worthy heritage as opposed to their more on road worthy one that the last generation was. Right from Mall Finder to back to, to kind of rugged off roader. Um. So yes, yes. It's they could have. It's it's a very good looking SUV. I like the. Got Toyo tires, which are great. Actual all terrain. It's got a little bit of a lift, like half an inch. It's got a cool roof rack on it. Great paint. Uh, they could have gone a little further with actual off road gear and tech. Um, like it would have been nice to have a skid plate, right, versus fake beadlock wheels. But it was a good thing to drive on the road. They really nailed the auto driving dynamics for dirt roads, for light forest roads. It's a fantastic vehicle. And I'm glad that it doesn't have a CVT anymore. It's got a conventional automatic transmission. So pretty good. All right, before we wrap this up, uh, uh, I do want to mention that there was a bit of important news uh, this week. It had nothing to do with electric cars, finally, and that is that the uh, new Mustang is being introduced at the Detroit Auto Show. Is there a Detroit Auto Show happening? There is, yeah, in, wow. in two months, in September, uh, and it's being, actually it's one month by the time this thing airs. Uh, yeah, so there will be a new Mustang uh, coming, uh, and that's very exciting. We also know that the, if you're a Porsche fan, uh, that the new uh, GT3 RS is being unveiled uh, at Pebble Beach, um, so uh, that's going to be another car where people are going to be throwing money at Porsche. Uh, I, 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 I'm always like amazed at how much people will pay for a Piran race car when mm -hmm. they don't actually race it, but that's the way of the world. Uh, and uh, you know, we just had the new Colorado. And for me, the most important thing is check out uh, TFL Truck, where myself, David, uh, Jay, and uh, Cole, our videographer, actually drove the lightning all the way up to Coldfoot. Uh, the, 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 the kind of the first part of that adventure video is going to be, or is up at this point, on uh, all TFL, or you can just go over to TFL Truck. Yeah, absolutely. And let us know what you guys think in the comments. We'll see you on the next video. See you guys next time. Ciao.